Welcome to the Bad Roman Podcast, where we talk with veterans, community leaders, and Christians and non-Christians as we explore the entanglement of Christians with the state. The Bad Roman Project was created out of the firm belief that as Christians, we are called to follow Christ, not the state. Here is your host, Craig Hargis. Hey folks, today I have Mark West on the show. He uh, writes for the God Archie website and has been featured on their podcast as well. So I thought I'd have him on today to talk about his article called Jesus is Why I Left the GOP. How are you doing today, sir? Oh man, I'm doing as well as I can to be cooped up uh, in quarantine. First, won't you uh, give us some give us some background of yourself? All right, well, um, currently I am married uh, to a awesome woman her name's christy and she is one of those uh, frontline healthcare workers uh, she's a nurse in a healthcare clinic uh, for uams here in arkansas and uh so we're dealing with this uh anxiety head on uh just uh those of you that pray just uh, keep her lifted up in your prayer because the way this has been handled has created a lot of anxiety uh for her uh, and she needs the prayers. Um, we have three children. I love all of them. One of them's in college, uh, and then one is about to go into high school, and the other one's in junior high. So we do everything we can to take care of them and, and, and instill uh, true Christianity in them, uh, the true version of Christianity, as I see it, uh, the one that that actually takes Jesus at his word and actually tries to do what he said rather than just try to impose some type of society on people. But um, I was born and raised in West Memphis, Arkansas. Uh, my dad worked on a lightweight aggregate plant. Uh, that's how he paved uh, the way for me to get through school. me and my brother and the family. My my mom was a secretary and worked as a secretary for many years. Uh, but they both worked hard, worked a lot. Uh, we were lower middle class, but they made sure our needs were provided for. Um, we didn't go to church much growing up. Uh, vacation Bible school was about it. We would just catch the bus every summer, and that was our church, basically. Uh, we did do, I do remember when we were real little, going to some Sunday school or something, because I I, I do remember that, but but we didn't much until uh, we I was in high school. Um, but I made a decision uh, at a vacation Bible school. Uh, it was me and a buddy, and a buddy had challenged me to just go up there and let's see what happens. Uh, so that's what we did. Uh, so it wasn't the real deal. And then when I was in high school, I was at a revival, and this hellfire and brimstone preacher was preaching, and I made another decision. But again, it wasn't real. It was all about this. As, and, and so much of Christianity is this. There's this fear of, of going to hell, and we're trying to get this this life insurance type thing so that we don't go to hell. But really, that's not what salvation truly is. And the first three times that I made a decision, uh, quotation marks, it was about trying to escape from hell. Uh, the last time when I fully and finally surrendered my life, it was about wanting to have my life changed into what God wanted it to be. Um, at that point in my life, we'd been married, and I decided that we needed to, I needed to be reading the Bible if I was going to be a Christian man. Uh, so I started reading it. Uh, Genesis was boring, so I jumped to the New Testament only to find out that it was boring too. But I decided to plow through, and I got to the seventh day of reading, and I was in Matthew chapter 7, where Jesus talks about entering through the narrow gate, uh, staying off the broad road because it leads to destruction. And I knew that moment that my life had been lived on that broad road, that there was no narrow gate for me. I had been on the broad road. I was on the easy path. I was headed to destruction. Uh, and then I got later and I was, you know, as I'm pondering this, I'm like, yeah, but you know, three times I've made a decision, you know, I, I belong to him. I've got to belong to him. And then I get down further in and verse 21, where it says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, uh, is belongs to me, but only those who do the will of my father. Uh, and that just jumped out to me and I was like, well, what is the will of my father? So that became something that I became just, uh, infatuated with just trying to understand what that meant. And I began to understand, you know, that the will of the Father begins with putting faith in who Jesus is, that he was 
and still is fully God, fully man, that he died as a perfect sacrifice to make a way to have God look at him instead of look at me and my sin. He looks at Christ and his perfection. And he became that so that he could fill me with the Holy Spirit and empower my life so that my life could be transformed uh, from the inside out, so that my life could be about uh, humility and, and service and surrender uh, instead of this chasing everything in the world that I was doing before that. And then uh, shortly after I got saved, I really felt um, this this burden uh, to teach and to share what I had learned, and I began doing that, and I wound up in, in the ministry, and that was where I spent 15 years as a bivocational ministry. And for those who don't know what that means, that means that I pastored a church while also working a full-time job. The reason for that is most of your bigger churches that want a full-time pastor require a seminary degree, and it was something I couldn't afford. So I had to do the bivocational route. And even still today, these churches, you know, me with 15 years of experience, they will take a seminary grad, first day seminary grad over me with 15 years of ministry experience in a heartbeat uh, because the church has become very corporatized. And, uh, and that is... And that is where my story leads me here, is uh, the last church I pastored, uh, the last summer that I pastored there, I was getting into the springtime before the last summer that I was at that church, and I started reading the Sermon on the Mount and just really started trying to lay that beside my life. And I was like, you know what? My life, the way I do all this, doesn't really add up. You can't have this... Uh, this, I hate to use the word, but you can't really have a political faith and follow Jesus Christ. The two are contrary to one another if you read the Sermon on the Mount. Because when you read the Sermon on the Mount, you're constantly surrendering your rights. If somebody slaps you in the face, you surrender your right to smack them back. If they steal your shirt, you surrender your right to go tackle them and take your shirt back. Or if they sue you, you're surrendering your right to counter sue. Uh, this is the lifestyle that Jesus was laying out in the Sermon on the Mount. And I began to realize, you know, this is totally contrary to who I am. This is totally contrary to the way we live it in America, the way our culture lives Christianity. We have an American cultural Christianity, but it is not the Christianity Jesus talked about in the Sermon on the Mount. So I did a 12-part sermon series and walked through the Sermon on the Mount that last summer when I was at that church, and that began... I began converting that into the book uh, that I'm now writing. So that's a roundabout way to get you where I am. Of course, you know, with this whole walk, I had this political side to me because when I was in college, I studied political analysis. I, uh, uh, I wanted to be a political analyst. Uh, my degree in college was in radio and television broadcasting, and I had a minor in political science. I was ready to be one of these talking heads on CNN or MSNBC or Fox News, one of these big network guys. That was what I wanted. Um, so this political element was always there lingering on the side, but I was in the, I was in the neocon corner. Uh, I was a heavy, big supporter of, of W. Bush in both of his, both of his election campaigns. Voted for him twice, but about midway through his second term, I began to realize that that this uh, this war footing that we were on was against the gospel, uh, and that so much of what we were spending nationally was against the gospel. So I began to really turn uh, about midway through. I still begrudgingly voted for McCain just because we we, we couldn't let the liberal win, uh, as as I believed at that time. Uh, but that was the same year that just I really changed. I ran into an old friend from high school, and he was one of these libertarian people that I'd heard about. And he began explaining the philosophy to me and, and how it, you know, what libertarian is, the non-aggression principle, how that applies, uh, how we should apply it, not just politically, but socially uh, to the way we carry on. And at that point, I became a libertarian. Uh, the Libertarian Party recruited me in 2015 uh, to run for U.S. House uh, District 1 in 2016, and we did that campaign and got 23% uh, of the vote. Uh, it was head-to-head -head with a very popular Republican incumbent. That was the, that was the Trump election. Uh, there was such a big influence uh, of people that came, influx of people that came to the polls to vote for Trump, and they voted for any Republican down the ballot. So 
if it had been the typical election, our percentage probably would have been closer to 30 to 35 percent. But the way that election went, if you weren't a Republican, you weren't getting Trump supporters. Um, and then uh, we discussed it and decided to go ahead and try to use that momentum to run for governor in 2018 uh, here in Arkansas. So I ran for Arkansas governor in 2018. Uh, and in August to September of that campaign, uh, that was the time that I was preaching this Sermon on the Mount series at church. I, I began coming to this understanding that God doesn't want me doing this. Uh, but I was in the campaign. I was the guy on the ballot. I had to finish it. So I finished the race as best I could. But at the same time, I really grappled with this. How do I live the Sermon on the Mount as a governor imposing uh, my will on other people or opposing my ideas on other people? So at that point, after I finished that campaign, I just took some time off and uh, had a bout of depression and anxiety in a scale that you wouldn't believe. Um, but continued to read the Sermon on the Mountain, think about the Sermon on the Mountain, work on this book, and just have been really drawn away from trying to use political means to transform society uh, toward this mindset of, of Christ, as Paul calls us to in Philippians 2, have the same mind that Christ had, that, that you're surrendering everything just to be God's slave, to be whatever he asks you to be. And that's how he changes society. He doesn't change society because I'm able to get more people to vote for a Christian candidate. He changes society because Christians live like Christians. And when we do that everywhere, society will change. We're only going to rid society of the things that are destroying society by changing the hearts of individuals in our society. And that is where you find me today, uh, just trying to find ways to live my faith, uh, to live my witness, to transform hearts so that we can transform society from the ground up. That's awesome. I I remember uh, when, I, when I first moved to Memphis, I, I believe, and I was still a, a voting, I was still involved in voting and stuff at the time, but I when I moved here, I was pushing or you know, encouraging people back in Arkansas to vote, vote for you when you were running for governor. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, me and you, we've never met face to face, but we've, we've had, you know, we've crossed each other's paths quite a bit, you know, through with mutual friends on Facebook, especially on the, on the political side of it. Right. And I remember watching you, I kind of, kind of watched your change towards the end. I, I was starting to notice it a little bit myself. It's interesting that you put the, that you pointed that out because there was, I think you got to the libertarian side of it a lot quicker than I did. You know, when you mentioned in your article about Ron Paul in uh, 2012, and I'll be honest, I wasn't near as enthusiastic about voting for McCain as I was for George W. Bush. <laughs> but like you said, we didn't. Yeah, that McCain vote was tough. <laughs> but, you know, you, you hold your nose, vote for the lesser of two evils, right? Well, that's all garbage anyway. But but during that uh, 2012 Republican debate when Ron Paul was talking about, you know, he made a comment, you know, you, do you understand why they, they're, they're mad at us? You know, and he was getting booed off the stage and I was one of the guys booing him off the stage. And I think at that point you were, <laughs> you were more, you were more on board with Ron Paul or what he was talking about at that time. I was still, you know, we're still, we gotta, we gotta keep the liberals off here because they're going to ruin everything for us. Yeah. See, I was in the Ron Paul camp at that point. Uh, and uh, I was excited about his candidacy because everything he stood for was was things that I was beginning to understand and grasp in the political uh, specter as far as what libertarian was and what it really meant to actually be a libertarian and practice libertarianism. Uh, as he said, you know, do you know if we do unto others as we would have them do unto us in foreign policy, maybe we would have less problems uh, and less conflicts internationally. Uh, and he got booed off the stage for, I mean, they, they vociferously and viciously booed him uh, during that debate. And I just remember sitting there and I was like, man, what has happened? This is the party that is, you know, I was a Republican because we were the Christian values party. We are the party that we are God's appointed party to protect America from the liberals and from abortion and, and from immigration and from all these things. And and Ron Paul, uh, listening to what he taught, listening to him, him speak, 
I began to understand how wrong headed a lot of those views were, uh, and, and how mis how misapplied the Christian faith was through the Republican Party at that point. And the Republican Party has only gotten worse since then. They've not gotten better. They've not been stronger at fighting for Christian values. They've gotten worse. I mean, just look at who the current president is. If you want to talk about a family values president, that's not the guy. Um, and it, it, it just continued to drift away from that. And I began to see that the Republican Party really was about trying to shore up a power base. And they were using the language of Christianity to shore up that power base when really they were more interested in the power than the principles. And that was why I supported Ron Paul as I was interested in the principles. Now, of course, at that point, I still went and voted for John McCain just because I couldn't imagine some liberal taking over. Um, but I have changed a lot since then. Uh, and as you said, you saw like the last parts of my transformation during the the. 2018 campaign for governor, I went through a major uh, viewpoint transformation, a worldview transformation at that point uh, during that during that race. Uh, but that that shift began in in 2012 by uh, watching that debate. Why do you think that Christians are so adamant about sticking with the Republican Party? I mean, the majority of Christians, I should say, because they still talk somewhat about you know abortion and stuff. But they don't ever try and do anything about it. Is it just something they're trying to hold on, or is, it, or is it fear? Do you think they're afraid to step outside of that box and then to support somebody else or just get away from politics altogether? I'll tell you what, once I got stepped away, I've, I've become a lot happier person than I was when I was involved. I mean, because I was, you're entangled in all that garbage, and you're, you're constantly mad at somebody else. And, exactly. You know, you're talking about Jesus, you know, in the Sermon on the Mount. I love I love that portion, or that, that part of the Bible, uh, because... When I started, when I started studying anarchism, and you start applying it to your Christian principles, I could see a correlation with the two, and it made a lot of sense to me how anarchy and or voluntarism could align right. with my faith. Well, I mean, I think what you run into is you have a lot of legalism in Christianity, especially in American Christianity, and it's the same thing that Israel was trying to do when Jesus walked. Uh, there was this mindset among the Israelites that if we keep the law right, and if we have the law right, if we basically if we have the right laws and the right obedience to those laws, then society will be saved. And yet Jesus comes along and says, no, the law does not save you. I save you. A relationship with me is what saves you. Uh, and he transformed that. And he even talks about that in the Sermon on the Mount, uh, where they have the comment where he makes the comment about, uh, you know, I've not come to destroy the law and the prophets. I've come to fulfill the law and the prophets. And he says, you know, whoever uh, does not keep these uh, and, and teaches others not to do so, you know, is, is in bad shape. And then whoever uh, keeps these laws, they'll be called blessed. But then he, but then he says, but your righteousness should surpass that of the scribes and the Pharisees. Now, the scribes and the Pharisees had a very legalistic, right laws, right actions kind of of religious practice. And Jesus was calling us to more. And that more that we get is number one, His righteousness, Christ's righteousness, becomes our righteousness. But number two, His Holy Spirit helps us live in such a way that what the law says doesn't matter anymore because we're not going to defy God. Or if we're listening to his spirit, we will not defy God. Our flesh will still lead us in defiance uh, in times when we're weak and not relying on the spirit like we should. Uh, but the spirit will lead us to God. It will lead us to the Father and into the way of Christ. Uh, and unfortunately, what happens with us is we let our flesh lead us to look back to the law. Uh, to look back to this these guidelines. Um, and it, it's one of the things, uh, you know, in the, how that mindset plays out in the current church, this, this right laws, right actions mindset is they want laws that are pro-life. But, you know, the idea of pro-life to them is just pro-unborn child life. Uh, 
And they believe if we have the right laws in place, then God will bless us. But God doesn't anywhere in Scripture promise us that he's going to bless us if we have the right laws in place. He promises he will bless us as we follow his son, as we trust his son, as we allow his Holy Spirit to live in our lives. That's where God blesses us. And how that plays out in politics is is if I see someone who's considering an abortion, I'm probably going to be more effective if I come alongside that person and I help them financially. I help them with uh, getting skills and education and the things they need uh, to keep that child. I'm, I'm more of a service to them if I help them find someone who's willing to privately adopt their child. That's where I am more effective than I am if I'm trying to get a politician to pass a law that forces them to have a child. I mean, do you see what I'm saying? It's this concept of, of let's put our faith into practice. You know, just because we make something a law doesn't mean people are going to stop doing what the law says. I mean, most states, uh, actually every single state in the country, murder is against the law. But guess what? How many people do we still have get murdered in this country every year? Because people don't change their actions because the law says the right thing. They change their actions because their heart gets transformed. Our job as Christians is to live allowing the Holy Spirit to transform our lives and to work through us to change other people's lives. And that's how we change society. That's how we become blessed by God, uh, by humbly submitting ourselves to just follow what God is leading us into, uh, not by trying to force Christianity into the lives of other people. That doesn't help anybody. That doesn't change anything. Uh, having a Christian law doesn't change the way people behave, but transforming their hearts changes how they behave, and that's what we do. We share the gospel through the way we live, and the Holy Spirit transforms the hearts. Well, Mark, it sounds like you're suggesting that we cannot legislate morality. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> Well, I mean, we, we, we can try, but the law isn't going to make anybody not do something that they have already decided they're going to do. Uh, just think about guns, you know, how, and that's the one, you know, disconnect is you will hear this, this big, uh, especially among, uh, you know, the, this right wing Christian community that, well, you know, they'll never get my guns. I don't care what law they pass. They're not taking my guns. It's immoral for them to take my guns. I don't care what the law says. So in one breath, they're admitting that the law doesn't really matter if you don't want to obey that law. But on the other breath, they're like, well, we've got to pass pro-life laws because we've got to protect the unborn children. Well, hold on. You, you're admitting in one breath that it doesn't really matter what the law says. People are going to do what they want to anyway. But in the same sentence, you're saying that somehow or another, by having this law, people are not going to do it. And and it's just it's asinine, the disconnect, um, when really what we need to be doing is trying to get into these situations, these scenarios, and, and help these women not choose it. I mean, what I would much prefer a society where people don't even consider the thought of getting an abortion. Right. Rather than having a society where I force people to have to uh, take uh, undue risks uh, to have abortions, I would rather be one working on the ground convincing people not to and, and giving them a better alternative to it. And that's one of the arguments you hear with uh, on the on the right as well as far as immigration is concerned. Mm -hmm. Well, it's the law, you know they 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 need to come here legally. Well, I don't, you know, I to me when you when you when you're saying something like that, you're saying that you're calling a, a human being an illegal person because they're trying to you know do something better their lives for their family, you know, mm -hmm. or, or make a better life for their family, you know. It's, but you're calling them illegal. Because the United States law says that. Well, I don't know. I, I don't. I don't see any anywhere in Scripture where Jesus tells us to forbid somebody from crossing a border because government says so. He suppose he says you love your friend or you love your neighbor. That and that these people are our neighbors, whether you want to admit to it. And it's not the guy that's living you know, next door to you. Of course, they're your neighbor, but it's everybody. Everybody you come in contact with. And I think you make that point in your article as well. But when you, one thing you said about with uh, Ron Paul, we'll go back to him a little bit. And you said you quoted him in, in your article saying, maybe we ought to consider a golden rule in foreign policy. Don't do to other nations what we don't want to, them to do to us. And that, that was a Ron Paul quote from the debate stage. And I'm, at that time, I was still, the, you know, booing him off the stage guy. You know, it's, because as far as I was concerned, what we were doing 
And a lot of people still think that way. We were doing the right thing by dropping bombs on other countries and killing them because before they kill us over here, and if we don't do that, they're going to come attack us again. But how would you, and I'm specifically talking about Christians, how, how do you think we should apply this individually on a daily basis? Well, I think it's it's pretty easy for us, uh, especially as Christians, because we should always consider how each of our actions are going to be received by someone else. Uh, and in that vein, you know, we need to think of how we would receive that action if it was done to us. You know, if, if yelling over the fence at my neighbor, uh, it, you know, if I would be upset if my neighbor yelled over the fence at me, maybe it would be a good idea to not do the same to them. And, you know, this gets, you know, that that's a very simplistic application. But when you think about that, it applies uh, to more sectors of our life. You know, uh, if you don't want uh, someone to kick you when you're down, then don't kick someone when they're down. Try to provide an opportunity to show mercy to someone who doesn't deserve mercy, because we all know that that mercy is something we all need. It's something that's a desire in each of our hearts. I think that a re the reason we have a lot of the conflict and dismay that we have in our society is because we we hold on to everything. You know, Jesus told us in the Sermon on the Mount uh, to to not always try to seek vengeance. Uh, that that was one of his big things, you know, when it, the whole turn the other cheek passage, that's, that's where that borders on. Uh, and a lot of the time you can defuse a lot of things by just refusing to allow it to, to grow, you know, by trying to deescalate a situation. Uh, a lot of things can be resolved through simple deescalation. And I know it sounds wimpy, but sometimes you just, you have to flight. Uh, you know, we, we like to fight, uh, but a lot of the time uh, we can resolve a lot of the situations around us by just simple flight and de-escalation. Uh, we don't like doing that because we like to fight for our rights uh, because we're Americans and that's the way we're born and that's the way we were bred and that's how we choose to live. But uh, I hope that kind of answers your question, you know, is, is trying to put it in a rubber meets the road kind of, of term, uh, put it in shoe leather, so to speak, uh, that we we just have to be willing to sometimes lay aside our rights for the sake of loving our neighbor and doing unto other people as we'd have them do unto us. And that includes everybody that, you know, just like Ron Paul was talking about, as far as foreign policy, you know, reading it now, I think it's, it was great what he said, because it's so true. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, it, we're, we're good at making our enemies like Muslims, you know, I, th that is one of the, that has been one of the tragic things since nine eleven is the way that the Christian community has treated the, the Islamic community. Uh, and it's also a tragedy of our society, the way the, the evangelical community has treated the uh, gay and homosexual community. We, we don't treat them as we would want to be treated. We treat them spitefully. Um, and, and I think that's where a lot of the division that hurts the evangelical community in trying to reach out uh, to Muslims or to people in the LGBTQ plus, you know, whatever community, I, th I think that, that we hurt ourselves a lot with that by just not, not lending an ear, not lending compassion, not lending mercy. Uh, those things hurt us and actually trying to effectively reach them with the gospel. Yeah, I think that, that's perfect because, I, and I spoke about this guy I work with on our first episode that we released. Uh, he's from Syria and some of the best people I've met in my lives have been Muslims, you know, just because they look a different way or, you know, that doesn't mean they're, they're actually Muslim. I think, you know, he's married to a white lady here in Tennessee that, and she's a, she's full blown redneck. <laughs> so, you know, they're, and it's funny, they're mixed, but he goes to church <laughs> with her, but just because he's from Syria, he's automatically assumed to be a Muslim. And these are from, from Christians. And, and even if he was a Muslim, it wouldn't, it, it, you know, this, the conversations we have with each other at work, this guy's one of the funniest people I've ever met in my lives. And when I was living in Fayetteville, one of my neighbors in the apartment complex I was living with, living in, he was from, uh, I want to say it was Pakistan, mm -hmm. you know, and every year it was at Ramadan is, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, but every, whenever that was going on, they always had a sign on their door. Basically, I guess they shut themselves in, but one day he uh, was outside. I was on my way to work and he was cooking some stuff out on a grill. And 
we were talking and and he said when this is done he said i'll bring you some i said well i'm going to work and, and he said but, but i think the next day he saved me a plate i mean a plate full of food and brought it over to me the next day and it was just it was good food i mean you know it's just these people are they're just because you know there's some people that are acting the way they do as terrorists or whatever doesn't mean the whole group is like that right. these, some of these people are some they're great people and it reminds me of a quote what you were just talking about and i, I may murder this quote but there's something gandhi said and i love it and he says he said i love your christ or i like your christ but i don't like your christianity right and and that that's the thing we we, we rob ourselves of the opportunity to get to meet these individuals on a personal level and in a way that may that that could be transformational for their lives uh, by getting to know us on that personal individual level. Uh, when when I was working in Memphis, uh, there was a Muslim couple uh, that I used to do all their deposits. That was back when I was a bank teller. It was many years ago. Uh, but when I left to go into the ministry, they actually bought me gifts uh, because I was going into the ministry. They actually had some some uh, statues and some ornament things that were carved from trees uh, in the, the, you know, on Mount, all, you know, the Mount of Olives, you know, the olive trees over there uh, that they gave me as a gift uh, to go into the ministry. I've got one of my friends since college. Uh, he, he's a Muslim, uh, but he has been a good friend to me uh, and has he and his wife and his kids are dear to me. And, you know, I, I've, tried to be the best, you know, witness for the gospel before him that I can. And at the same time, he's been the best witness for Islam before me that he can. And what it's led to is a very uh, good relationship between the two of us. Um, and, and you know, it, everything doesn't have to end in this battle and in this conflict. Uh, we can, you know, we, we need to have these conversations. And unfortunately, our religiosity keeps us from these conversations. Uh, we're so worried that, somehow we're going to become corrupted. Uh, and I, I really think that uh, the over-corporatization of our church and this, you know, why it's frowned on if you have a gay friend or a Muslim friend, but it's not frowned on if you're a, a gossip or a liar in the church, uh, you know, that, that that blows my mind. You know, it's, it's like, it's a greater sin to have a friend who's who's in the LGBTQ plus community or a friend who is a Muslim than it is to be someone who is, who is, you know, an active gossip or a glutton. And really, biblically, it's more sinful to be a gossip or a glutton and call yourself a Christian than it is the other way, you know, to do the other things, to have friendships with people that are lost. Because if you don't have friendships with people that don't know the gospel, who are you going to share the gospel with? Uh, you've got to build those relationships and living out the Sermon on the Mount opens those opportunities for you to have those relationships and have those transformational conversations that share the transformation in your life uh, with others. And, and, and through the power of the Holy Spirit and through prayer, you can see those lives be transformed as well. That's perfect. Uh, man, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us. And when you get that book published, let me know and I'll, I'll pick it up and give it a read. We'll have you back on to talk about it. Uh, that sounds great. Um, I'm still working on the, you know, how you have your little subtitle, but it'll, it, it'll be called What He Said, and I'm hoping to have it out and available by this summer. I like the title already because that's what we need to focus on and what Jesus said. Exactly. Is there anything else you'd like to plug before we get out of here? And I'll let you get back to your family and your honeydew list. Um, well, if you guys can uh, remember me on uh, Twitter, I'm at, at mark 4 Libertas on Twitter. Uh, on there, I promote my blog. I post a lot of my articles that I write. So I try to write a couple of blog posts a week. Uh, right now, I'm posting a lot about the the SARS COVID uh, thing, especially here in Arkansas. I'm kind of tracking it and putting together charts and logarithms so that we can kind of understand how it's spreading and and have a what what I call a a view that includes perspective. But every day, as I share my stats on the virus. I share a brief devotional uh, at the bottom each day. So I'm trying to use even that vehicle as an avenue to share my faith with others. Uh, today was about the resurrection. Uh, the reminder of that is coming up. So uh, if you get a chance, I, it, the blog is Mark for Libertas. That is Mark and the number four and then Libertas, L-I-B-E-R-T-A-S 
www.wordpress.com. Uh, if you can go on there and just click on the link for the blog, you can check out my my daily blog on there because uh, I will be, as I get on further through the book, I'll be posting more of uh, excerpts from the book on there as well. Okay, cool. That sounds that sounds great, man. Uh, and also, if y'all haven't read his article from John Gardner, Keith, uh, Jesus is Wild at the GOP. It's an excellent article and I highly recommend it. All right, man, I'm going to let you get back to your family and I really appreciate this. We'll do this again soon. All right, no problem. I enjoyed it. Uh, looking forward to it. All right, buddy. Thanks for joining us this week on the Bad Roman Podcast. You can subscribe to the show wherever podcasts are found. And if you like what you hear, be sure to leave us a rating as it is the best way to help other people find us. Hey folks, Craig here. And I'd like to let y'all know we are always looking for writers to contribute to our blog. I don't care if you have any experience or not. Two or three of our contributors have no prior experience writing, and it turns out they have a real knack for it. Our project coordinator helps them put the articles together, and she publishes them on our website and Facebook page, and you will also have the option to come on the show and go more in depth about your article. So if you like what we're doing at The Bad Roman and would like to try your hand at writing, then send us an email at thebadromanpodcast at gmail.com. If you would like to donate to the show, learn more, or connect with us, you can visit our website, thebadroman.com. Until next time, remember, sometimes being a good Christian means being a bad Roman.